Hello, welcome to this TASTE lecture for the program Sustainable Water Environments. In the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to speak to you about coastal wetlands and particularly coastal intertidal wetlands. So these are areas that are not inundated during a low tide, but are partially or fully flooded during a high tide. So these wetlands are flooded by saline water, which means that any plants or animals living in these conditions must have adapted to salt water. Mangroves are intertidal wetlands in the tropical and subtropical regions of, of the globe. And this genus here, Rhizophora, is probably the one that most people will associate with mangroves because of its typical roots that emerge from the trunk and reach down to the mud. However, the genus Avicennia is probably the most widespread genus of mangrove. Um, you will find these trees from New Zealand up to, um, to the US. And they have a rather different type of root. These pneumatophores or pencil roots um, have the function of aerating the soil. And they use these little white dots, these lenticels, to increase the oxygen supply from the air to the underground here to aid uptake of, of nutrients. So as I've said, mangroves you will find mostly in the tropical and subtropical regions, um, that is, uh, pantropical, so around the globe. Uh, you will find them up to, um, in the north, up to Florida, and all the way in the south here, up to South Africa, or even the North Island of New Zealand. The hotspot of biodiversity of mangroves, or the most species of mangrove trees, you will find here in Southeast Asia. Salt marsh are um, more at more temperate habitat, so this species here, uh, or this genus, Salicornia, is the one that may be most familiar to you because it's a plant that you sometimes find also on, on your plate. It's, a, it's an edible um, succulent um, uh, plant that is, that is sold sometimes as a delicacy. And these plants are succulent, which means they, they take up water and salt, and that builds up over the year inside the plant, and they will eventually die off in the winter and regenerate from seed the next year. So these are annual plants that have adapted to growing in the intertidal environment. Another genus is Botaina. Um, you will find this genus again across the globe. You'll find that in New Zealand, in China, Europe, um, uh, Americas, um, with, with different species. And this is a very efficient colonizer of intertidal mudflats. So th these plants are perennial, so they will regrow from underground growth every year, and they will um, colonize the, the mudflats either from seed or through um, the rhizomes or the underground um, growth um, the next year. So salt marsh, as I've mentioned, are mainly found in the temperate regions, um, but they do co-occur with uh, mangrove wetlands. So salt marshes, salt marsh plants are often more adapted to high saline or hypersaline conditions. So you will find them, some of the salt marsh plants behind the, um, the mangrove forest in arid uh, or semi-arid conditions. So in, the, in Australia, for example, where it's very dry, um, when the, the tide can't reach the end of the mangrove anymore, that's why you will see salt marshes coming in um, coping with very, very high salinities because of the lack of rainfall and the supply of salt water. So intertidal wetlands have one thing in common, they're all zoned according to the inundation. So basically that means if you're, if you're on a slope along a coastline and you have the tide coming in and out at different times of day and different seasonalities, we'll have a gradient of inundation uh, frequency and also inundation duration. And the plant communities will adjust to that flooding regime. So you can typically divide the intertidal wetland plant communities into zones. So whether that's um, a salt marsh here, where you'll have a pioneer zone with a typical um, pioneer species, the one I've shown here, Salicornia and Spatina, um, a lower salt marsh zone with a more varied biodiversity of salt marsh plants, and the upper zone where um, some of those salt marsh plants start to disappear and less salt tolerant but more competitive plants can occupy the upper bits. 
So this donation nomenclature is different from different countries in different countries and different regions. Um, so this is just an example here. Um, issues surrounding coastal wetlands are, for example, erosion or coastal erosion. So this is partially caused by humans. So with rising sea levels, um, with altered sediment supply because of dam building upstream, we will we currently see a lot of erosion happening on some of the major delta eight regions, especially ar around the globe. So this here is the Mekong Delta in the 1980s. And if I just toggle back and forth here between 2020 and back to 1984, you can see how much this eastern edge of the Mekong Delta is actually receding due to coastal erosion. And the picture here on the, on the right hand side is taken in the Mekong Delta showing some of these areas of very rapid erosion, several tens to hundreds of meters per year. Other issues, more direct human impacts is land use change for aquaculture. Um, this map here is from Indonesia. And you can see the individual ponds here. These are aquaculture ponds, mainly for shrimp. Um, and they've dug into the mangrove. They've been dug into the mangrove forest. So that obviously is a problem because the mangrove has been um, cut down for it. And there's potential risk of pollution in this area that will negatively influence um, the surrounding mangroves as well. The good news is that these systems can be restored. So this is the same area um, a couple of years later. We can see that almost disappeared here and regrown um, the area where we previously had aquaculture ponds. However, other parts here are still, still barren. So there's a lot of management in coastal wetlands um, although these systems appear always very dynamic and natural, there's been a huge amount of interference by humans um, that we need to manage. And for that, we need to understand the processes that, that drive um, how these weapons function. So and one incentive to promote wetland restoration and improve management is to harness the ecosystem services or benefits that these coastal wetlands provide to us. Um, so some of the services are listed here. One of them is coastal protection. So the vegetation along the coast will dampen wave energy during storm events. And that contributes to uh, the disaster risk reduction for local communities. Coastal wetland soils, because they are salty and waterlogged, store particularly large amounts of carbon underground. And keeping that carbon in place is beneficial to our climate and hence this is a climate change mitigation contribution by our coastal wetlands that we can value. Um, they also contribute to uh, local fisheries because coastal wetlands are typically a, a nursery habitat for fish and crustaceans. And there are many more benefits. And this um, idea of harnessing um, nature or you know, habitats or improving habitat management for our societal benefits um, is a nature-based solution. So when we manage, better manage and restore our coastal wetlands, um, this will deliver human well-being while also de delivering biodiversity benefits. And this can be uh, harnessed with, you know, financial incentives to promote um, these um, services that the systems provide.